you so much, Dr. Mosal. Welcome to the session, everyone. I'm Meng Chuan Lai, co-chair of the EDIA Council for Clinical Care. It's my great honor to introduce our first speakers for our very first session, Building Social Interventions and Community Engagement at an Academic Health Center, Lessons for Psychiatry. We have two amazing speakers here. Uh, Nassim Vahidi Williams is the manager of patient and community engagement at the St. Michael's Hospital Academic Family Health Team. Grounded in years of frontline health promotion experience, she is dedicated to addressing individual, systemic, and environmental factors that impact health status. Her professional activities focus on capacity building through program development and management. Her research interests include social determinants of health, racialized women's health, and HIV risk behaviors across diverse ethnic populations. Together with Nassim, we have Gary Block, who is a family physician with St. Michael's Hospital and Inner City Health Associates, and an associate professor at the University of Toronto. His clinical program innovation, education, research, policy, and advocacy interests focus on the intersection between primary care, health equity, and the social determinants of health. He is a co-founder of the Physician Homeless Service Group, Inner City Health Associates, and the advocacy group, Health Providers Against Poverty. He has developed numerous innovative clinical programs for primary care teams and educational curricula for healthcare trainees, and served on an Ontario government task force targeting income security. He is an AMS Phoenix Fellow and a Senior Fellow with the Wellesley Institute. So let's welcome Nassim and Gary. Thanks so much, Meng Shuan. And I will just share my screen. A sec here. Let's see if this works. OK, you can see that. You can hear us. All good? All right, well, we are very excited to be here. So I'm Gary, as was mentioned. Uh, Nassim's, sorry, I can't even see you, Nassim, somewhere on the right screen. Right here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Never know with Zoom. Sometimes people just disappear. I'm going to see if I can just, there. Uh, there you are. Okay, perfect. I'll feel very out of sorts. I can't see my co presenter. Um, Okay, so we're very excited to be speaking with you today. Um, we are going to spend, we, we've just been given an extra 15 minutes, which is wonderful. Uh, so we're gonna talk very slowly and make our way through this and hopefully uh, have some time to just kind of absorb and think about what we're gonna put forward. Um, and, and really what we're gonna talk about today is, is the work that we've been doing based out of our family health team at St. Mike's. Uh, and we're gonna kind of situate that for you a little bit um, and, and sort of build out a story of uh, what a social interventions and advocacy program based in uh, a large interdisciplinary healthcare team can look like. Um, so before we get into that, uh, just a little bit of just kind of self situation. So as was mentioned, um, I am a family physician. Uh, I'm also a father of three. Uh, I'm also a white cisgender heterosexual male um, who experiences uh, significant privilege in this society. And I think it's important to acknowledge that I'm speaking from that position of privilege uh, while telling you this story as we move forward. Nassim, I don't know if you want to say anything before we jump in. Thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to be here and to chat with everyone. Um, my role at the family health team comes from um, a, a momentum around building um, programs and services um, and decision-making processes that are informed by the populations that we work with. Um, so I come with lived experience as well because of that. Um, my, uh, I, I'm a settler here. I benefit from settler colonialism, of course. I know many of us here do. Um, I, I come from the Middle East. Um, my, my parents are both Middle Eastern and um, my mom is Dakhtiari, which means that I have a special connection um, to indigeneity in a global sense um, and feel very responsible to um, 
center the relationship that we have with um, colonialism and all the work that we do. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm also a racialized woman and um, also a parent and I happen to have strep throat uh, given to me by my daughter today. So I'm going to uh, power through a presentation, but I do um, really enjoy talking about um, all of these topics um, and I hope we can have a, a very fruitful discussion this morning. Thanks, Nassim. Yeah, I think one of my many privileges at this point in time is having children who are beyond the age of spreading viruses throughout my house on a constant basis. Thanks for being here, Nassim, <laughs> through all that. All right, so there we go. Uh, so this is the latest iteration of a strategic plan for our department. And th this is not what we're going to go through in detail, but I, I put this up here for two reasons. First of all, just to remind us to describe who we are a little bit, and second of all, to point out a few key features here. So our, our family health team is a very large family health team. I, I think the largest, uh, for sure the largest academic family health team in the province uh, and one of the largest family health teams overall. Uh, we serve almost 50,000 rostered patients uh, throughout the downtown east part of Toronto. Um, we, and we do that through five different clinics with about 80-ish family physicians and about, I think, 250 other staff uh, of all types of disciplines, backgrounds, supports. Um, so, so really a, a, a very exciting space to work in and a, and a very broad and diverse space to work in. Um, the reason I wanted to put up the strategic plan was really to point out the way that approaches to equity and advocacy and addressing social determinants of health have really been kind of, uh, or increasingly kind of baked into the core of how we conceive of ourselves as a team, right? So I can tell you that our strategic plans did not always look like this, right? I don't even need to use the pointer to, to for, for you to see the words equity and advocacy and, and other sort of um, uh, words that are very relevant to today's topics in this strategic plan. But, you know, I mean, right down to the kind of core vision of, the, of our department, which is really to, to serve as global leaders in equity-driven primary health care and in advocacy. And it's taken a lot of work and a lot of just inward looking thought and discussion and exploration about who we want to be as a team to come to uh, a, a strat plan that looks like this. And, that, that, and, and, and this is really what's kind of guiding us forward. Um, and we've been doing this work for a while. So, you know, we, we've really been working very intensely on the idea of building a program of social intervention and a program focused on addressing health inequities. You know, I, I'd say in a, in a very focused way for the last 12 or 13 years, um, but there is a stream of this work that goes right back to the founding of our team uh, back in the 70s, but, but really have kind of shifted to, to a lightning focus on this over the last decade or so. Um, and so much so that we actually decided to produce a booklet that kind of tells the story of some of what we've done. This is available at the website you see there uh, at Unity Health, um, just to kind of give a sense of what the arc of the story looks like. So if you have, you know, if you, if you want to sort of fill in some of the details, we won't tell all the story today, uh, feel free to kind of dig this up on the web. It, it's more pictures than text, just so you know, so it's a very easy read. Um, and we've been guided in this work in our department uh, by what we've called the Social Determinants of Health Committee. Um, and this committee has been in place since 2013. Uh, it's a broadly interdisciplinary committee. Uh, it's led by Nassim and myself. Um, it includes, you know, really membership from across our department, uh, you know, family physicians, many types of other interdisciplinary health providers, uh, learners. When we get them to the table, uh, if they can make the meetings. Uh, and over the last uh, five or six years, we've done a lot of work to integrate a voice of lived experience into the committee as well. And, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that process uh, later on today, but that's been really transformative. Um, we get around 20, oh, and, and sorry, departmental leadership is very much at this table. 
Uh, and, and we get about 25 to 30 people coming out to each of our meetings. And this really serves as a, a kind of thinking space and a, a planning space and a vetting space for the type of work uh, that we try to do, which you know, is, is not simple work, right? And it really needs a space for, for many voices to come together in a, in a fairly diverse way. So what we're gonna do today is really lay out you know, I, I've called this sort of four elements of a story of transformation, uh, but really four different areas in, in which we've put a lot of thought uh, and resources and effort into building out this program on social interventions and advocacy. So Nassim, do you wanna add anything to that kind of lead in story before I jump into the first one there? We're just gonna kind of go back and forth through this presentation. No, good, okay. Perfect. And I should also say, feel free to sort of throw in questions at any point. We'll keep an eye on the Q&A um, and very happy to sort of address thoughts, questions, challenges, uh, uh, you know, whatever comes out. And we will definitely have time at the end of this to, to dig into that in more detail. And, and I should say on that note, uh, I, I don't think either of us or really any of us involved in this work thinks that we in any way get this right. Uh, this is very much an evolving area of exploration and development. Um, it's it's critically challenging, uh, and and we are challenged by both internal and external developments over time. Um, so are always looking for strong critical voices in, in what we do to help us kind of improve this. So. The first big element of our work and this program of action really has focused on the idea of social interventions. Um, social intervention is a term that we've kind of come to over time, like sort of as we built up, uh, you know, really started with an, a, an idea that we should find ways to address the social factors that affect our patients' health. Um, and you know, I'll give you some examples of what we've done, of course, in just a moment, but I think our understanding of what this concept means has, has really sort of evolved. Uh, and if I was gonna try and start to pin down, I don't have a, a definition yet uh, to present you on social interventions. I think that's kind of coming, but some of those key elements of what makes up this realm of social interventions of what I've kind of listed here. Um, the social interventions, first of all, must work from a truly holistic understanding of health, right? Meaning an understanding that places social factors on an equal level to the sort of traditional physical and mental health factors that, that we are trained to deal with. Second of all, social interventions need to think about targeting not just the kind of hard social determinants of health, like income and housing, but also broader health inequities, right? And, and, and what that means is we need to be thinking about, um, you know, again, those social structures, but also the, the, the deeper systemic structures that really permeate our society and, 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 and determine the shape of our society and also permeate ourselves. Um, and until we're able to work at both of those levels, I, I don't think we're going to get this idea of social interventions or we're, gonna, we're not gonna make them particularly effective. And so we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, social interventions must start from a, from a deep attempt to identify social risk um, because until we can see what those factors are that are impacting the social factors that are impacting our patients' health until we can truly understand them, uh, we'll, we won't be very effective in trying to address them. Uh, and finally, social interventions are about intervention, right? And, and this is really about attempts to intervene to mitigate those negative effects of these social and structural factors that uh, impact patients' health and always keeping that view to broader structural change, right? And I, I think that, if nothing else, is really a tie-in to, uh, to this advocacy day that we're speaking at here. So I did a, a sort of uh, dive into the literature a couple of years ago now uh, to, to look at what's happened in this realm of social interventions. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the findings there, but I will tell you, first of all, that there's 
uh, rapidly growing interest in this area. There's been a uh, truly an exponential increase in the amount of literature being produced on this. Um, and, you know, what, what I had, I mean, I was kind of surprised by this, right? I, working in our little bubble over here, I hadn't realized truly how much was going on uh, internationally in this work. And so I tried to sort of boil down the, the, the categories of intervention, or uh, boil down the interventions into sort of broader categories. And this is what kind of came out, right? First of all, uh, a real need to look at the collection of social data. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. Then actually looking at interventions, but interventions for individuals that target intervention, individuals, interventions that target communities, uh, work on what I've called equity oriented practice change, which again goes into that sort of more critical reflective type work that needs to be done for ourselves as practitioners and within our practices. And all of this uh, underlain with the, the need to work towards supporting efforts at social change uh, at a broader level. So in terms of what we've done at our team, um, you know, we, we, we really have tried to address this at a number of levels. And I'll say that we started very basic, right? And when I say very basic, I mean, literally with like the, the page that you see in front of you, which some of you may be familiar with, right? This is something that, uh, you know, I think the first version of this was produced about 15 years ago now. Uh, something called a clinical tool on poverty, right? And what this offered up was just a three-step approach to dealing with a social issue in a typical frontline uh, healthcare interaction, you know, really designed for primary care. So like a typical 10 to 15 minute interaction and just suggested, you know, first of all, that we screen everyone. Second of all, that we adjust the way we think about uh, our patient's risk based on their social situation. And third of all, that we intervene and mainly by helping people connect with high yield income support programs, because in this case, we're dealing with poverty. Now, I will say that I think, I mean, all of these steps are important and all of these steps have helped to kind of frame out uh, some of our ind individual level interventions work. Um, but I'm gonna suggest that the first step on this tool uh, is maybe the most kind of foundational step in terms of step uh, in terms of delving into this uh, realm of social interventions. And this is the area, again, coming back to this idea of needing to understand or identify social risk, of screening, of data collection, you can frame this in many different ways. And so we have done this in our team in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, training people to, to start talking and asking questions around this, but also starting into some systematic work um, around asking questions of everybody that we serve around what we've called their socio-demographic profile or their health equity profile, but really attempting to build up an understanding of who we're serving, um, which once we have this data, which we do not have good enough data yet, but we're sort of working towards that, will hopefully allow us to understand, first of all, differential outcomes for different groups and who we're not serving uh, and especially not serving well. Um, and especially once we match this with community-based data. So not the most exciting to present, but in many ways, um, probably again, the most important foundational step from an interventions perspective because without this, we just don't even know what the territory is that we're working within. I will suggest that we also need to do this in far deeper ways, right? And so more and more in my thinking around this, um, I am veering towards taking much deeper story-based, narrative-based approaches to understanding uh, the complexities of individual social situations and community social situations. And, you know, I, I feel sort of uh, strange saying this to a group of psychiatrists. I think psychiatry has done this better than any other uh, realm of medicine, but it's still worth saying, right? And, and this is a, a wonderful quote from a pediatrician in New York, Dr. Santani Dasgupta, who reminds us that stories are not the 
end goal. They're not a treasure we dig up. They're not a simple repository of facts, but rather they're a process. And listening to them is an act of social justice, right? And I think this is an important reminder because it's it, it, it it puts forward this idea that we are delving not into simple areas of understanding social need, but we're delving into vastly complex, uh, a vastly complex realm of trying to comprehend the, the totality of people's lives and people's stories when we're talking about this, this idea of, of social interventions. And, and we need to keep that complexity very much at the forefront of our mind. Um, we've also built uh, very specifically targeted social interventions programs uh, to support our individual patients. You know, things like having two full-time income security health promoters on our team, um, whose literal job it is to, to work on in income security with our patients and with our team members, and to some degree with our communities uh, as their entire job and they've been quite successful at that. Um, and they're very busy in the work that they do. Uh, we've also developed something called the Health Justice Program, which, which is really a medical legal partnership where we have a group of legal aid clinics that supports lawyers to come into our team and work directly with our low-income patients on a myriad of legal issues. Um, again, a hugely popular program um, and especially for people who are socially marginalized and, and wouldn't have e easy access to legal services otherwise. Um, and we are just delving into something called uh, social prescribing. Uh, and I mean, really what we've been doing is social prescribing all along, but we're, we're now developing a more formal social prescribing program, which really means a program that is targeted at working with people who are socially marginalized to connect them with the myriad of community supports and resources uh, that are available in our communities. And, and we've just received funding to develop a program like this uh, for socially marginalized older adults uh, who are over 55. Um, as part of this, we'll, we'll also, we'll, we'll be using that funding to really build out a uh, a much deeper community engagement uh, and community orientation structure within our team. Uh, which Nassim will kind of can get into in her remarks in just a moment. Um, and actually, I'm going to turn it over to Nassim here because another really powerful program, uh, powerful in its simplicity, but also its impact is our patient comfort fund. Thanks, Gary. Um, I'm going to pause before I, I get into some of this. Um, I want to recognize some of the things I've heard so far this morning. Um, one, um, that <clears throat> it's required to do implicit bias training. Um, that was a very important remark for me and happy that that's happening. Um, and I'm about to talk about community engagement and, and how do we involve the populations that we um, we work with in decision making, um, in care, in um, all kinds of ways in our healthcare system and design. Um, and before I do that, I just want to talk about um, what we did at the beginning of this presentation, what, what um, you all did so well, which was um, positionality and considering your own social location, who you are and what you're bringing to the work. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, similar, similar to housing first philosophy, relationships first um, is very important in terms of community engagement. Um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, but uh, to do this work can be harmful. Um, and in order to mitigate some of that harm, um, really the first step is bringing yourself into your practice um, and being comfortable with that um, relationship that you have to all of these pieces around us um, that make up our, our um, social realities. And, um, you know, I, I don't have a slide on it, but I would be remiss just because of the conversation we're having today, um, not to mention the Broff and Brenner model, which I think some of you are familiar with, um, which is widely recognized as the first socio-ecological model of understanding in terms of healthcare. And it was a child development model, which has kind of been expanded um, across sectors and disciplines um, to, to really look at um, 
you know, outside of that um, defined identity that we um, subject folks to in our world, um, what are the layers of experience that folks have? Um, and when we talk about things like social data and when we talk about things like community engagement, um, we have to recognize that we are doing this in a context um, that has, sorry, that has been um, really put upon the folks that we're working with. Um, so you'll see this in, in terms of equity work in things like language. Um, for example, we, we say racialized instead of minority anymore in, in Canada and, and otherwise. Um, and that's because we want to recognize that these processes are things that are being done to the individuals that we work with. Um, so when we are engaging in, um, you know, building relationships with the communities that we work with um, <clears throat> and the individuals that we work with that are socially marginalized, recognizing that we actually are all participating in these in these social systems of oppression. Um, we're all participating in racism, every single one of us, similar to how we participate in, in gendered ways of being. Um, so uh, I think, you know, sometimes there's some contention for folks to recognize what we participate in every day and what we bring to our interactions with um, the people and the communities that we work with. Um, but this is the, the reality of, of where we're starting. Um, so I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about our patient comfort fund and then I'll get into community engagement. Um, I wanted to share this because it's been impactful for me. Um, like Gary said, we, we recently received some funding for um, building a new social prescribing program, but as you have seen, we have been doing this work for some time. Um, one of the ways that we do this work is, is through uh, a fund that we call the, the patient comfort fund. Um, it's entirely um, comprised of, of fundraising dollars. Um, and uh, we are we are now and are looking to in the future um, fund it with uh, various grants and, and pieces that we have applied for. Um, this comfort fund is um, really discretionary, um, but we haven't, I, I think we've maybe said no one, one or two times in terms of providers that have brought forward requests um, for acute needs that patients present with. Um, and they are acute needs that don't uh, typically get addressed in terms of healthcare settings. Um, but obviously, as we know, we're talking today about the social determinants of health and community engagement, um, EDI. These are um, the interventions that matter for our, our patients' lives. Um, so just to provide a few examples, um, mattresses and bed frames are actually a very common um, request uh, from providers to support our patients. Many of our patients are, um, are, are do not have mattresses. Um, and obviously I don't have to tell you how impactful that can be to your um, overall health. Um, and in particular, this one I wanted to share with you that came, all, all of these examples are actually from the last month. Um, in an apartment, uh, the, the couple was, um, uh, needed needed fumigation because of bed bugs, but um, but one one partner was bed bound, um, and they are are sleeping on the floor, um, getting bed bug bites. So an intervention that we suggested that the patient um, was was uh, readily agreeing to was to support with a, a mattress and a bed frame, stepwise progression. But at least we can make a difference for that patient um, in this way. Um, you know, we, we do um, support our patients in accessing, um, you know, ADP and other funds that will cover assistive devices and mobility aids. Sometimes it's not enough. Um, so we are able to use the patient comfort fund. Um, for example, in this case, $100 for um, a VHA home care company to send a walker to a patient. So you can see that even with these programs that um, are, are intended to support um, folks that are on ODSP or, or living in or experiencing poverty, um, there, there are you know, these, these kind of um, minor payments that they're expected to make like $100 here and there that um, are absolutely unreasonable for some of our patients to make. So next slide. Um, just a couple more examples um, in terms of food security. Um, we have a, a, a team of folks working to support a patient um, to bridge a gap between now and when um, ongoing funds will be provided to support this patient with ongoing food insecurity. 
Um, but currently just, again, like the, the patient has an acute need um, for, for funds to support um, insure um, and working with a, a dietitian on our team um, to, to try to impact some behavior change and change in how they're engaging with eating behaviors, um, but absolutely still needed the, the interim insure. Um, the next example I wanted to share um, was a, a patient that um, actually was uh, in a process of paying back um, a bankruptcy uh, loan and it was, was sort of halfway through the, the year before discharge um, and had made all the payments successfully and um, had a, a challenge with their um, WSIB claim. Um, and we were able to, to pay a one-time stopgap payment for this patient so that they would not have to um, extend the period where they would be uh, discharged from bankruptcy and would make a significant impact in this patient's life. Um, so now I'll talk about community engagement. Um, and I, I just wanted to share those examples to, um, to offer a, a, a different way of thinking about how we can provide care. Um, but I'll also talk about community engagement today and um, want us to just keep in mind some of the things I said about mitigating harm, which I'll talk about as well on a slide. Okay, go ahead. So um, in, in terms of our, our health care... Nassim, Joe yeah. Connolly has a question about whether oh. or not in the first example, the couple with bed bugs, happy they got a bed frame and mattress, but could they, was their place fumigated to deal with the bed bugs? Yeah, and so commenting on such a good example of how complicated patients can be with social SDOH issues. So sorry, I didn't see that question. Thanks, Joe. Um, so the the this is recent. Um, the apartment was not fumigated yet. The challenge is that um, wife is um, is bed bound um, and and uh, very unwell. Um, so again, these are um, great examples of how our clinical care needs to be outside of our four walls. Um, so, so this particular couple, um, they absolutely need a team of folks to support them in home. Um, we'll likely need a team if uh, we, we haven't explored yet in terms of um, moving for fumigation. Um, to be honest, Joe, there is a huge majority of patients that I work with and we work with that live with bed bugs. Um, in fact, I, I have um, a number of, of patients that I know that um, tell me in the summer months, they keep their, their kiddos outside on playgrounds till quite late as, as, as much as possible. So they can spend time outside of their home and reduce the amount of bites that the family is getting. Um, so absolutely, I, I, I think that there are some things that we can do to, to continue to support this couple. So the, the mattress and the bed frame were kind of a first, a first step. I hope that answers your question, but yes, very complicated. <laughs> Um, and thank you, Joe, and, and please do uh, continue with the questions. I, I do love the interaction and Gary and I will we'll get to them um, as much as much as we can. Um, so just back to this healthcare arena around um, patient engagement, I will say that um, there's a, a bit of in, intellectualizing this work um, around engagement and, and we have some theories and frameworks and, and, and lovely things to tell us how to do this. Um, I will make a bit of a, um, I'll distinguish a bit between patient engagement and community engagement though, um, as, as someone who does this work every day, I'll, I'll tell you that they're really the same thing. Um, the HQO, so Health Quality Ontario, has excellent resources around patient engagement. I'm sure many of you are familiar. Um, we know that the momentum for including uh, patients in improving healthcare work is, is, is great. Um, as Gary said, there's, there's huge interest in, in how to do this work. Um, you'll see that through um, you know, uh, legislation like the Healthcare for All, um, Excellence Act, um, we have included patient and family advisors um, as, a, as a feature of, of many of our, our healthcare settings. Um, so that's one way that we've seen um, patients and community members become involved in, in healthcare settings. Um, and maybe I'll just go to the next slide. 
Um, so the main type of, of patient engagement, um, what this looks like typically right now in many healthcare settings is recruiting advisors, orienting them to the organization, preparing staff to work with advisors, supporting staff and the advisors, and really taking requests from internal working groups, research studies, folks that want to engage patients in their work and connecting them to your patient group that's established, that um, you know, should have a, a regular meeting schedule, should have a couple staff supporting them. Um, and uh, the advisors then begin to engage with different members of the team throughout the organization. So this is happening in our organization, this is happening at the FIT, this is happening elsewhere. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly common um, at this stage in the game. I'll continue. Um, however, what you can see is that um, typically what this type of uh, patient engagement work achieves is um, consulting, involving, type of work um, in terms of the spectrum of how we engage folks in the work that we do. Where we want to be, and I think where you all want to be in terms of the comments that you've made today in setting up an advocacy day, um, is, is looking at collaborating and, and empowering patients um, and community members to work with us and really um, direct us in terms of uh, what the best choices are on how to provide health care. Um, so this is a community engagement and uh, leadership framework. Um, really, this slide is just to show you that you can, you can um, engage patients in decision making and collaboration um, and consultation um, in direct care in your organizational and design and governance. And you can do it, engage patients in, in policy making and procedure development. Um, so there are kind of three levels of engagement. Um, and through each level of engagement, um, you can look at the, the spectrum. And um, it, it may be really helpful to think about, you know, how, how what, what do I want from the patient or community member in this particular case? Um, you know, is it is it that I want to consult with the patient? Um, you know, I, I want to involve them in their treatment plan, um, or you know, am I working with a, a group of patients that I want to support in leading an initiative to improve healthcare? Um, so it's it's really helpful to have that knowledge um, in terms of what your um, goals are in working with patients and communities, so you can offer that transparency. Um, I wanted to share some successful principles of, of community engagement, um, incorporating uh, the voice and the agency of Indigenous and ethnic and cultural communities, of course, we, we are talking about that today. Um, real power sharing, so that kind of goes back to the, the piece around empowerment, um, as opposed to informing and consulting. Um, Bidirectional learning, our patients and community members come with excellent assets. Um, this is a, an experience of learning from, from one another and working together. Um, this says needs assessment here, really, we, we use the language of situational assessment um, to recognize that um, we do need data around what patients, um, patients and communities are prioritizing in terms of their health experiences um, and uh, social care experiences. But to use the language of situational assessment, um, takes the needs assessment and recognizes the assets that our community members bring to the table. Um, and I'll share, um, I, I think I, I, I might have a couple of folks from that will know about this um, on, the, on the call. Um, but our partners in St. Jamestown um, are actually offering a large scale community consultation today, um, which is called the Spring Gathering, which um, we and our, our partners, uh, a group called the Service Provider Network in St. Jamestown, which is an excellent par partnership. Um, they do this every year, um, bring patients together for, for a dinner, for a talk. Um, for table conversations around healthcare um, and take that information back and use it for planning um, collaborative services over the next year. We can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a, a bit about what I was talking about in terms of harm. Um, exhaustion, um, consultation fatigue, disappointment, um, so typically when we begin to do this work, we have what you might see in the literature as super patients. Um, so patients that are, are those that will come forward for every ask. When you do a call out, it's the same five patients. Um, 
patients that, you know, your organization becomes familiar with the same patients. Um, these are folks that we have to, you know, think a bit about um, protection for. Um, because typically they are folks that are very engaged in wanting to see change in healthcare um, and can experience consultation fatigue and disappointment. Um, so just thinking a bit about that um, and wanting to um, create structures when you engage patients to enable a diverse, um, a diverse set of experiences and voices to come to the table and being uh, mindful that if the same patients are coming to the table, then either you're looking at patients that are well resourced and can come to the table, or you're looking at patients that might be experiencing consultation fatigue. Um, financial burden, I there's lots and lots of discussion about how to compensate patients um, and community members around this type of work. Um, I'm not going to get into that today because we could, Gary and I could do a whole nother talk on that. Um, there are some, there are some, some things that I can direct folks to. There's a change foundation tool called um, Should Money Come Into It, um, which is essentially a, a, like a flow chart of, of considering how you're engaging with patients and communities and how to compensate them. The Downtown East Ontario Health Team has also developed an excellent tool um, around how, how to consider com compensation um, and honoraria for patients and community members. Um, it's, it's a bit of a, a complicated, um, a bit of a complicated arena of this work. Um, the other consideration, obviously many of you will, will know this, is that payments can impact um, OW, ODSP, social housing. Um, so being very transparent with patients is, is extremely important um, if you are providing honoraria and supporting patients in um, navigating what, what that means for them. Um, those with disabilities are not accommodated. So we know from literature that um, folks that are living with disabilities are, are typically not at the table. Um, and that's because we live in an ableist world and we do not um, often make the considerations um, that are, are needed to ensure that um, folks that are living with invisible, visible disabilities are able to meaningfully participate. Um, I, I won't talk much about the, the using payments piece. We can, we can discuss that through maybe questions or at another time. Um, negative participant experiences with only consultation. So this just goes back to the spectrum of engagement um, and, and the transparency piece when you're asking folks to collaborate with you, to come on board for a project, to be a part of their treatment plan, um, you know, really being transparent about what the patient can impact. Um, there, I think you'll find, and, and we found with our, our patient advisory council, I can share that our experience was that um, there was a, quite a lot of, of management of expectations. Um, we, we work in a bureaucratic system um, and being honest and transparent with patients about that from the start has been very important in terms of building trust. Um, I wanted to share this slide because I, I was asked many years ago in an interview how do you relate to the populations you work with? And as I said in the beginning kind of positionality statement I made, I am the populations that we work with. Um, there, there is no us in them for me. Um, I think that that might be true for, for some of you on the call today. Um, it's it's an interesting experience um, to be someone with, with lived experience in, in a role like this, um, though I can say that, you know, Gary and I have talked about this, but in the literature we are seeing in the last, I would say, five years or so that the, the missing piece um, in, in healthcare reform in terms of um, equity informed decision making is really including um, folks that have lived experience in our teams. Um, so uh, just to say um, some of the principles of trauma-informed and community building um, look like structural frames, social justice, trying to mitigate harm as much as possible, um, acceptance of folks where they're at, sharing community power, and thinking about sustainability. Um, I'll go to the next slide. This just builds on the last slide and how to enact the principles. This is how do you actually do this work? Um, I won't go through all of them, um, but you can see here that this is a, a bit of a framework in terms of um, your everyday decision-making. So how do I remove the participation barriers? 
how do I provide compensation in a way that makes sense for the particular group or patient I'm working for? How do I honor the history, the legacies of violence that some of the patients have been have bring, bring to the, the tables that you're asking them to come to or the appointments that they're coming to and also celebrating their identity? Um, making community growth and accomplishments visible, um, you know, it being a reflective process. These are all things that we all know, um, I think, but um, really bringing it to the front of our, our consciousness in terms of our everyday work. I think this one. Sorry, my mute button disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I'll turn um, it over to Gary. For maybe that's better. Piece. I don't know. No, so so I, I think I'm going to actually not spend a lot of time on this area other than because I think we've really kind of talked through this, right? The, this idea that um, a, a good bit of the work that needs to be done with teams, and this is something that we have sort of learned over time, needs to focus on the, that, that piece around understanding health inequities from a really deep structural change perspective, from a critical reflective perspective. You know, I'll say simply that we have done that as a team, right? Or, or I shouldn't say we've done it. We are doing that as a team. <laughs> we are engaged in it. Uh, we got a long way to go, but we're, we're doing uh, a lot of work around uh, racism, especially anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. We have uh, you know, really good, strong, thoughtful working groups uh, in these areas um, that, that have carried forward a lot of work within our department for all of our staff, for our leadership, uh, engaging patients. And it's, uh, it's, it's really deep and difficult work. It's been going on for about five years now. And I'd say we're still just kind of getting a sense of what the scope of this is in terms of really understanding uh, how the realities of racism weave their way into uh, the, the the work that we do and, and the structures that we work in. Um, we've also done some work around just starting to train our providers to, to look at what they do through an explicit health equity lens using things like what's called health equity impact assessments, um, which are really kind of structured tools that, that carry people through an analysis of their programs and services and team structures, um, again, through the, the lens of understanding their impact on uh, socially marginalized groups. Um, but I really wanna use our last few minutes to talk about advocacy. Um, and you know, th th there's really kind of two levels at which we have sort of, sort of two big buckets or two big ways that we've addressed advocacy in our department. Um, one is through developing a framework to support our providers and our team members in carrying forward advocacy on issues that impact the health of our patients. Um, th this is a structure that involves uh, means of accessing mentorship from more experienced advocates. It also involves uh, specific structured ways of bringing in team or departmental support for advocacy initiatives, right? So really guiding departmental leadership in terms of how to determine whether an advocacy ask is something that is relevant to our direction, strategic plan, goals, and the health issues facing our patients. You know, and happy, it's, there's a lovely document that was developed by a couple of our, of our providers a number of years ago that I'd be happy to share with anyone who's interested. Um, we've also been carrying out full department-wide advocacy initiatives, um, and these are initiatives that uh, we actually have put out calls for, for proposals and had the department vote on what they would like to focus on. And I'm just going to turn back to Nassim to describe these two initiatives briefly. Um, <clears throat> I think we have a couple of slides actually, do you have any, Gary? To go, yeah. So, so this was um, yeah, this was the first accessibility for all. So, yeah. um, so we have a we have as Gary said we have an advocacy framework um, in our in our family health team that um, we have socialized with all of our, our team members. We've we've been doing this for years. Essentially, the the process is that um, any any group of folks um, can can come together when we do a call out internally um, for an advocacy proposal. 
Um, and then we, as, as Gary shared um, a little bit about, we determine as a department which proposal to support over the next year. Um, and uh, this particular proposal that came through in our last round of um, call outs for, for advocacy projects was led by one of our excellent patient partners. Um, her name is Janet Rodriguez. Um, and she essentially came to a, a few of us on, on the team and said, hey, listen, we need to put a proposal together around accessibility and ableism. Um, and so we really, she came up with the name <laughs> Accessibility for All. Um, and uh, I, I, I won't spend, again, too much time about it today. We, we actually have a, a, an, a wealth of, of information about this, this project. Um, we have at this point um, done a, a survey of, of patients online in terms of their, um, their needs around accessibility and accommodation and experiences um, around ableism in our, in our clinics. Um, and we had actually, uh, I would say approximately the respondent rate was, it was over 250 patients, um, which, was, which was good for us in terms of email um, call outs. In addition to that, because we know, of course, that we are not going to hear um, a, a diverse set of, of voices and experiences from email callouts, um, our, our patient actually partnered with us to facilitate two focus groups um, where, uh, you know, she and, and other patients that we have excellent partnerships with um, reached out to their communities um, and, and brought folks together for a focus group. Um, just to give you a sense of, of um, how this was structured to um, ensure meaningful participation, we had two ASL interpreters that we paid for these sessions. Um, we provided taxi chits um, to most of the participants. Um, obviously, there was an honoraria. Um, we had aid workers that some of our participants required to, to, to be there that we um, funded. Um, and of course, we funded our, our patients to support in facilitating the workshops. So, um, you know, all of these things were, were done just to ensure that people could meaningfully participate as someone would who doesn't have the same kinds of barriers. Um, I'm going to see if it's okay. I think I'm going to suggest that we skip through the details on the second advocacy project, just because yeah. I'm aware that we're basically at time and want to take time for questions. Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, the the first uh, advocacy project that we funded was really just around getting our our internal team. Um, familiar with um, the legacies of colonialism and, and how that relates to healthcare. Um, again, we, we won't spend too much, too much time on this, but um, I think you can go to the next slide, Gary. Um, really, it was just about um, it, the, the, I'll say the first one, the accessibility for all was kind of an external focus and the, um, what we called healing our roots, roots which was led by Suzanne Shush, um, was focused on internal engagement in education. Yeah, and, and just to, to sort of round out this advocacy piece, uh, again, this could take up an hour in itself, but just want to mention this project that both Nassim and I have been involved in leading over the last couple of years, which, which really sort of brings together what a lot of what we've been talking about, this idea of advocacy and community engagement um, uh, into a project that actually used funding to support community-led projects, three community-led projects across the country that with the only stipulation that they involve primary care providers in some way in their project. Um, and I think this is important because this is first of all funded by a major national medical organization, the College of Family Physicians of Canada, um, but also because it allowed us and, and is allowing us, we're still very much involved in the analysis of our learnings from this project, has, has allowed us to really start to think about what this intersection between deep community engagement uh, and efforts to advocate on issues impacting social and structural determinants of health, uh, really what that looks like and what some of the sort of structures and principles that we can draw from these learnings will look like so, so that we can kind of uh, push forward our conceptions of advocacy uh, within healthcare uh, 
you know, to towards centering the voice of communities in a very deep and real way. Um, and so hopefully this gives you an idea of kind of, you know, the, the kind of trajectory of our thinking as we've been engaged so deeply in this work over the last, uh, you know, decade or two. Uh, I mean, this is just a lovely quote from Arundhati Roy. So, and just something to keep in mind in terms of all of this advocacy work. Uh, I'm going to mention very quickly this idea of a, a model for organizational change. Uh, I will take 45 seconds on this. Um, this. This is another piece of work that's kind of evolving out of a lot of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, and, and really, this is something that, you know, I and others, along with a very powerful group of lived experience advisors have been working on for, you know, really for five years. I mean, with a significant break due to uh, that pandemic that happened in the middle, um, but really an attempt to sort of bring together in a, a sort of, a, 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 I guess, a tangible way, the elements of uh, uh, or really sort of the, 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 all the elements that a team or health providers need to think about if they really want to embed action on social and structural issues into the core of their healthcare practices. And I think what's interesting about this model as it evolves, and again, another talk uh, in itself for a future date, is that, you know, we certainly look to the interventions, which are represented here as kind of the, the growing trees on top of this model, but we need to do that deeper foundational work that's represented uh, down below to, 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 to strengthen, to feed the roots of those interventions in, in really big ways, right? And these are all the things that we have been sort of alluding to uh, through this talk, the type of things that we've been working on within our team and within ourselves, but everything from very powerfully letting lived experience stories come forward, working on critical change processes ourselves, ensuring that our healthcare spaces are safe, also making sure that we're supporting each other, right? So looking to, or, or looking beyond this idea of sort of, you know, the, the, the individual advocate moving forward and really looking this, at this as a community supported endeavor. And, and, and then also looking to how we can shift our actual health systems, our education systems to, change the way we conceptualize uh, and uh, of how we do this and also build in some of this work uh, really deep into the, the curricula and the systems that we work within. So I wish I could talk more about that, but I really do want to turn the last few minutes over to questions. So Nassim, any last words before we turn to Q&A there? Uh, no, no last words. I, I see one question and yeah. I'm just eager to, to get to a conversation. Go for it, yeah. Um, sharing. Yeah, so um, the, I, I see one question here from, from Ian Waters, thank you. And um, maybe I'll speak first and Gary, if there's anything you'd like to, to add. Um, so the question is, what have been some of the challenges for St. Mike's um, are fit in, in working with community partners uh, like St. Jamestown? This is a big question. <laughs> um, there are many challenges, many, many challenges. Um, and uh, I would say a, a couple things come to mind. So. Um, coming from a clinical environment, um, community development and community engagement work um, doesn't, doesn't fit the infrastructure that we have established. And the reason I say that is because typically we're looking at um, time spent for, for example, billing, time spent for some of our allied health um, colleagues around, um, you know, how many patients can you see in a day? Um, you know, these, these types of structures of how we organize our work and our workflow. Um, the reality of working with communities is that um, often you will, to use vernacular that some of you might recognize, all of you might not recognize, we often say something like hold up a wall in a, in a community event, which basically means just hang out with people. Um, get to know them, build trust. Um, in in St. Jamestown, um, you know, I've, I've worked in St. Jamestown for, for over 10 years. And I mean, if I go into that community, like I, I'm, I'm fed, I'm asked about my family and my daughter. And it's, 
it's it's a relationship of trust, but it's also a relationship that doesn't fit a structure of how many folks can I see in a day, how many encounters can I get in the charts? You know, it's um, it it must be oriented differently. Um, so I would say that um, one one challenge is um, how we structure our time and our workflow. Um, because to build these relationships actually takes you going to the communities to where the folks are at. So in health promotion, we have this, um, you know, this sort of phrase that we say all the time, which is meet folks where they're at. Um, you really do need to meet folks where they're at and coming from a clinical environment in, in the fit where um, we don't have roles that are structured to do that. Um, that's, a, that's, I'd say, a, a challenge. Um, and uh, I would say, I would say that to get around that challenge or, or a solution for that challenge is um, something that we've, we've already talked about, um, involving ambassadors and peer workers um, and uh, folks that are outreach workers um, on your teams and in your partnerships um, so that you can begin to build these trusting relationships. Um, and the, the other sort of, um, challenge that I'll, I'll put forward to all of you is that um, when you go into these communities, when you are going to where folks are meeting, um, you represent institutional violence, just as, as someone from St. Mike's. Um, and it may not be personal, but you will encounter um, frustration and you will encounter feedback that can be challenging to hear. Um, and you will encounter anger and um, especially when you're talking about experiences of healthcare, um, many of the communities that we want to engage um, are communities that have lived with legacies of violence um, directly related to healthcare institutions for many years. Um, so I would say another challenge is um, being prepared to not personalize some of this feedback. Um, because it's part of the work. Um, and I think it's it's challenging for, for some of us to hear some of these things because we have our hearts in the right place and, and we wanna make change and we wanna do the right thing. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more about being a, a, a conduit um, for, for many folks that you are, are chatting with, a safe space for many, and obviously many of you know this, um, for, for some of those feelings of frustration, um, in particular with St. Mike's and the FIT, um, we are perceived as a, a large organization, which we are. Um, we go into the community and we work with folks that, um, you know, maybe our grassroots organization of eight folks, right? And um, it's, a, it's a huge difference in terms of the power dynamic. Um, so being aware of that and um, really creating space for and facilitating the types of feedback around frustration around that relationship and that power dynamic is, um, is part of the process. Um, so I would say that, that that's a couple things I would, I would bring up. I could probably talk about challenges all day. Um, but I hope that answers your question, Ian. And I think we have a couple, a, a couple more and um, perhaps we're also running out of time. Yeah, Nassim, maybe I'll just, I'll throw this one question over you and I'll answer the, the Q&A one uh, sure. by writing. But yeah, because I think we're at time, but do you have any recommendations for organizations or individuals in Toronto to lead implicit bias training for organizations? That's from Jennifer in the chat. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts, um, Gary. Yeah, I, 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 in terms of implicit bias training, I, I don't. I mean, I, I think we have engaged a number of consultants around our anti-racism work specifically that have done some of this work. So I don't know if Nassim, if there's anyone from there, because you, you've been sort of right in the leadership of that. Yeah, I mean, there's um, obviously, I, I, perhaps this is what you're already connected to, but Harvard led the um, research around implicit bias um, association. Um, there are a number of um, individuals that we have worked with, um, of course, at the unity level, um, Alison Needham has been engaging a number of folks um, around anti-racism work, not specifically implicit bias. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have any recommendations off the top of my head for specifically implicit bias, um, but I would say that um, 
the Unity resources, um, I can say were developed in collaboration with Notisha Masakwai and, and she's excellent in terms of understanding how bias um, impacts our decision making in both individual care and um, organizational decision making. So those resources I found were very helpful. Um, and maybe we can get back in terms of other recommendations. Yeah, and I, I'd also just say the Sanyas Cultural Safety Course does, you know, work kind of related to that. And then Janet Smiley, who's a family physician, researcher, Indigenous health, uh, Uber expert, uh, really has been doing a lot of work actually around implicit bias uh, training specifically or, or, or exploring uh, ways to identify and, and work with implicit bias. So I think watch for, for pieces coming out of her work as well. So sorry, we are three minutes over time, but I guess we'll turn it back to the organizers. 